Want to know something shocking? I'm a massive Batman fan. I know, it's insane, right? I, I mean, like, who likes Batman? He's this obscure comic book hero that has movies made about him. You'll never be able to tell the way we're always finding new ways to chronicle the Caped Crusader on this channel. But look, if you want to blame anyone for the number of times you've seen the cow in my thumbnails, well, the incredibly long history of rich storytelling that we've been gifted surrounding the world's greatest detective. Batman is, by all accounts, the most widely recognized and famous comic book character of all time, more than Superman, Spider-Man, or even the faces that the MCU have thrust into the spotlight, such as Captain America and Iron Man. That didn't happen by accident. More than 80 years worth of often meticulous, intense love and focus has been placed on this character, from his original stories created by Bob Kane and Bill Finger, through to Frank Miller's widely beloved The Dark Knight Returns serial in the 80s, right up to the modern comic age, with hundreds upon hundreds hundreds of diverse and often brilliant stories along the way. And that's a legacy of excellence that extends to Batman on the big screen as well. With 12 feature films over little more than 50 years, Batman isn't only a comic book icon, he's an institution of American cinema. Not only has the Caped Crusader led more solo theatrical releases than any other superhero to date, but he's been brought to life by some of the industry's most visionary filmmakers. Tim Burton, Joel Schumacher, Bruce Timm, Christopher Nolan, Zack Snyder, and now Matt Reeves. It's a pretty stacked lineup, and that's just counting the directors who got their films off the ground. Denis Villeneuve, Darren Aronofsky, Ben Affleck are just a handful of those who've made at least one serious push to add their own entry to the massive cinematic canon of Batman. What do you notice about all of these names? These aren't just gun-for-hire journeyman directors, they're auteurs filmmakers with distinct and uncompromising artistic vision and a desire to realize that vision with complete creative control. I'd argue no other superhero attracts this kind of talent more consistently than Batman. Sure, you get Sam Raimi's Spider-Man here or Richard Donner's Superman there, but one visionary does not a trend make. What's unique about Batman, what sets him apart on screen, is the consistency of directorial vision. Almost every cinematic incarnation of the character in the last 30 years has been helmed by directors generally agreed upon to be auteurs. But why is that? What is it about Batman that attracts these kinds of filmmakers? Let's find out together, shall we? But first, a message to the men in the audience. Has your luscious Christian Bale mane turned into a Michael Keaton widow's peak? Do you want a full head of lettuce to match that beautiful Batfleck beard? You're not alone. By the age of 35, two out of every three guys will start losing their hair. If you're not Bruce Wayne with a family fortune to invest in exotic hair replacement surgery, Keeps is here to help. With clinically proven treatments that are delivered via affordable plans right to your door, Keeps helps to stop hair loss and foster growth, providing expert hair care without having to go to the clinic or a pharmacy and pay marked up costs for treatment. But with that being said, Keeps' treatment plans aren't pseudoscience. They've been developed with the input and recommendations of doctors. Keeps' physicians will work with you to select the right products for your specific hair needs, and their 24-7 support system is made up of medical advisors, prescribers, and hair care specialists. Your treatment plan comes with a year of unlimited messaging so you can consult your prescribing doctor whenever you have a question. Whether you're looking to prevent hair loss or just take care of and promote the growth of the hair you've already got, hair loss stops with Keeps. To get 50% off your first order, go to keeps.com slash filmspeak or click the link in the description below. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash filmspeak. And thank you so much to Keeps for sponsoring today's video. Okay, we should probably address the elephant in the room, right? The most obvious reason Batman attracts visionary directors is because, again, he's one of, if not the most beloved comic book character of all time. If you're watching this, anyone you could possibly ask has, at the very least, heard of Batman, and that level of cultural saturation makes it far more likely that a filmmaker would be drawn to crafting a movie around 
around the character. You can't want to make a film about a character you've never heard of, so the fact Batman has been in the zeitgeist for well over 80 years is undoubtedly a significant part of why this character continues to be coveted by filmmakers. Likewise, because Batman is such a cultural juggernaut, Warner Brothers is more willing to take substantial amounts of money on new, sometimes radically different interpretations of the character. They know they'll probably see a return of their investment based on the character's name recognition alone, so why not hand the keys of the franchise over to someone like Matt Reeves or Tim Burton? The only Batman film that's been a disappointment at the box office is Batman and Robin, and that was Joel Schumacher's second go-around. The debut of his vision for the character Batman Forever was a massive box office success. I'd venture to say that just about anyone could take a crack at a Batman film, and no matter who they are, at least their first film would be a financial success, even if it wasn't a good movie. So the character's wildly popular, a surefire hit at the cinema. That's it, right? End of the video. Well, not exactly. While it's certainly a piece of the puzzle, it doesn't really offer a compelling answer to our core question, which is, why Batman specifically? Spider-Man is right up there in popularity with Batman. Superman's up there. In fact, I'm sure someone's in the comments right now arguing that one or both of those characters are even more popular than Batman. And yet, Spidey doesn't have the same cinematic track record. Not even close. Longtime viewers know how much I love the Amazing Spider-Man films, but I'd hesitate to call Mark Webb an auteur, and I definitely wouldn't call John Watts an auteur. So what's different about Batman? Why are filmmakers like Christopher Nolan chomping at the bit to take a crack at the Dark Knight, while other stratospherically popular characters get handed off to anonymous journeymen more often than not? Well, I'd argue it more or less comes down to genre. In a lot of ways, Batman is a superhero in name only. Sure, he has the trappings of a superhero, the outrageous costume, the colorful villains, the dual identity, not to mention his roots in comic book storytelling, but those roots run a bit deeper than that. Ultimately, Batman is indebted to two much older genres, pulp adventure fiction, like all comic book superheroes, and detective fiction. And I know what you're thinking. It's become a bit of a cliche to suggest a superhero movie is actually a hybrid of some other more niche genre. The MCU is notorious for employing this kind of rhetoric. Captain America is actually a political thriller, Black Widow is a really gritty spy movie, Spider-Man is an irreverent John Hughes style teen comedy, etc, etc. Sure, it's a great marketing tool, a nice way to stylistically differentiate these franchises in the eyes of the audience, but it usually rings a little hollow because the connection to these genres is only skin deep. These films typically borrow a handful of tropes and aesthetic signifiers from the genres they're imitating, and then plug them into what is otherwise a fairly standard superhero fare. Steve Rogers might go on the lam to outrun a government conspiracy like he's Roger Thornhill, but the film still ends with him suiting up to duke it out with a cyborg aboard an exploding helicarrier. The narrative structure of the story is fundamentally the same as just about any other superhero story, just with a glossy genre-inspired coat of paint. And that's one of my favorite superhero films ever, before you think I'm suddenly ripping on the Winter Soldier. Not at all. It's just a formula that works. You can change the aesthetic and throw little wrenches into the story, but it's a sure thing to stick to that basic skeleton of storytelling. But Batman's a little different. Batman and his big screen legacy have never been beholden to the comic book film. Hell, just as X-Men and Spider-Man were in full cinematic swing right through to when the MCU was deep into high gear, Batman's big screen presence was comprised of three films that almost deliberately are as far removed from the formula as possible long after cinema had entrenched itself firmly in it. And that's how it's always been. Batman walks to his own beat. His stories aren't just superhero narratives dressed up to look like pulp adventures and detective stories. Those genres are baked into the character's DNA. Batman, as he first appeared in the aptly named Detective Comics, was conceived by Finger and Kane as a cross between the hard-boiled detectives of noir fiction and popular pulp heroes like The Phantom and Zorro. So as you might expect, his stories take direct inspiration from these genres. Batman is is, at his core, a hard-boiled detective by way of pulp hero, and his stories are equal part crime fiction and pulp adventure, and it's this special alchemy of genres that give the character so much latitude. Unlike his peers, who are more or less confined to the superhero genre with occasional splashes of different genre influences, Batman isn't just one thing. Or if he is one thing, he's certainly his own thing. 
Batman movies in a way are a genre unto themselves. In other words, Batman is incredibly malleable. In 80 years of existence, he's been everything from a colorful paragon of vice and virtue to a violent, morally gray anti-hero. He starred in universe-spanning sci-fi adventures, larger-than-life capers, grounded crime thrillers, and tales of human endurance. There are so many different ways to interpret Batman, and so many variations across his long history, that it becomes hard to say which, if any, is the definitive version. Who's to say one incarnation is more valid than another when hundreds exist? And I think this flexibility is part of what makes the character so appealing to auteurs. Auteurs, by definition, seek artistic control. They have a singular vision and collaborate with others to realize it. So Batman is kind of a perfect fit because there is no one way to do Batman. They can come in and configure the character exactly to their liking. He's like a creative console of genre influences. You can turn the detective dial way up and slide the pulp meter all the way down if you want to tell hard-boiled stories of crime and human depravity. Or you can reduce the noir level and ramp up the pulp to depict him as a fantastical swashbuckler. Or you can max out the superhero and noir controls to tell a mythological epic. Filmmakers are free to modulate these settings however they want to, to create endless variations on the character without it ever feeling disconnected from his core identity. Entity. And because of his lack of traditional superpowers, he's free to push further into these other genres than most other superheroes can without stretching credulity. It's hard to imagine, say, Superman in a gritty western film where an evil gang of gun-toting criminals has a town held hostage. The movie would be over in, I don't know, two minutes? After all, bullets bounce off him and he can launch a goon into a wall faster than the speed of light. Batman, for all the fantastical elements that are there, feels a lot more human and and there it is, vulnerable than most other comic book heroes. Contrast this with a character like Spider-Man. Don't get me wrong, Spider-Man stories can be a lot of different things too, but they can't quite be anything. If you change too many fundamental genre elements, it stops feeling like a Spider-Man story pretty fast. Just look at the MCU Spider-Man, which attempted to impose a teen comedy genre on what has traditionally been a character rooted in interpersonal drama. This change was loudly rejected by a significant faction of the fanbase for not feeling in line with what they felt a Spider-Man story ought to be. So much so, I'd argue, that the studio spent an entire film retconning these elements to be more in line with the tropes and conventions fans expected. And I don't mean to pick on Spider-Man so much, but he's probably the most relevant point of comparison here. Because while we have a mostly shared understanding of who Batman is as a character, a rich orphan crime fighter who typically swears an oath not to kill, this ingrained acceptance of Batman's versatility means we're less particular about the kinds of stories told about him or the way they're told. One of the best examples of this flexibility is the world Batman inhabits, Gotham City. Like the best fictional worlds, Gotham is practically a character unto itself, and like Batman, the character of Gotham City can be modulated to evoke whatever genre the filmmakers want it to be. Because Gotham's not really a place, and this separation from our reality allows the world to serve as a reflection of the characters that inhabit it. Gotham is a canvas, and every director that has touched Batman Batman has used it to convey their take on the character. Tim Burton transformed the city into a German expressionist nightmare, while Joel Schumacher took that vision and tweaked it ever so slightly to become a neon punk phantasmagoria. Across Christopher Nolan's Batman trilogy, he carefully modulates the genre of the films and commensurately modulates the world in which they take place. In Batman Begins, Nolan depicts large swaths of Gotham, particularly a region known as the Narrows, as a dilapidated, poverty-stricken hellscape ripped straight from dystopian noir fiction like Blade Runner. But then, in The Dark Knight, he dials down this techno-noir influence and depicts Gotham as a fairly realistic city to evoke the story's more straightforward, Michael Mann-inspired crime drama focus. And then, he changes the city again in The Dark Knight Rises, when the film switches to a kind of rebellion epic, transforming Gotham into a war-torn wasteland as the rot at its core rises to the surface. By the same token, Batman's villains are just as reflective of the character's malleability as the world he inhabits. I don't think it's controversial to say Batman has the best rogues gallery of any superhero. 
and a big part of the reason why is the breadth and depth of the catalog. A lot of these characters can fit into any world, any genre a filmmaker wants. Just look at the Riddler, who, when the pulp meter is maxed out, can be a colorful camp trickster like in Batman Forever, but can then be transformed into a Zodiac-style serial killer when Matt Reeves turns up the detective noir influence in The Batman. And this even goes for most of his other villains. Even the most inherently cartoonish character like Mr. Freeze can become rich with pathos when filtered through a specific genre lens. Look at the cheese fest of Batman and Robin versus the melancholy of the episode Heart of Ice from Batman the Animated Series. Okay, so I dug into the animated pool for a second, forgive me. They've kind of hesitated to include Mr. Freeze in live action lately for reasons, so I'm just gonna go with what I've got. What makes these villains so interesting is that, like Batman, their inspirations are rooted in the psychology of film noir villains rather than the bombast of world domination seeking pulpy escapades. Those later elements are instead used to accentuate their foundation, one which is built in noir. The great noir villains force the protagonists to confront themselves while foiling the villain's scheme, functioning as shadows or even outright mirrors of the hero. The villains of Batman are no different. Each one has fragments of Bruce's psyche in them, little tiny pieces of similarity that are often exploited in their final confrontation, and while Batman always wins in the end, often force him to unmask himself. Noir is often viewed as being just one thing, but it's actually a wildly versatile foundation for storytelling. From there, as with the world of Gotham, these villain characters become an outlet through which filmmakers can mold the genre of the film. And because these characters are, yet again, so malleable, they are able to retain their core essence regardless of how they are transformed. But beyond the pliability this genre modulation affords filmmakers, the specific genres that comprise Batman are in and of themselves a huge draw. Say a director has a detective story, to tell. That can be a Batman story. Or maybe they have a mythological epic on their mind. That can also be a Batman story. Or a gangland mob story? Batman story. Pulp crime caper? Batman. Batman can be a vehicle to tell all these different kinds of stories with the full financial support of a major studio and built-in audience eager to see it. It's such a rare opportunity for filmmakers to tell the kinds of stories they want to tell within the IP-driven market we've found ourselves trapped in for the last few decades. From the other end of things, a closer look at the kinds of auteurs who have been drawn to the Batman over the years also reveals a lot about the character's innate appeal. For as wildly different as these filmmakers are, are from one another, there's a definitive trend that can be observed. They all tend to make films that explore the dark and disturbing aspects of society and the human condition. Even the director of one of the more frivolous, light-hearted takes on the character, Joel Schumacher, is a filmmaker whose filmography reflects a deep fascination with the macabre. Phone Booth is no camp fest. The Lost Boys might be lighter than that, but it's still pretty sinister. Given this proclivity, it's not hard to imagine why these filmmakers would gravitate to a character character like Batman. Like many noir protagonists before him, Batman has a complicated psychology. This is a man who watched his parents die as a child, and subsequently dresses as a bat to fight similarly disturbed criminals in the dark of night. Grief and trauma are a fundamental part of Batman, and both of these themes provide fertile ground for filmmakers to explore the dark recesses of the human soul. And sure enough, with the exception of the Adam West Batman of the 1960s, every cinematic incarnation of the Caped Crusader does exactly that. The extent to which this psychological trauma is explored varies depending on the genre conventions each director chooses to emphasize, but it speaks to the way the character's psychology gives these filmmakers something to chew on beyond simple action fare. This also comes in the form of thematic depth. These filmmakers use Batman to muse on the ideas that inspire them. You get a sense that they see a bit of themselves in Batman. Tim Burton, for example, has always been one to champion the weirdos and nonconformists of society. His films largely speak to the idea that normality is the mask and the true face is what lies beneath. And his Batman films are no different, grappling with ideas of duality and the outsider through its principal leads. Bruce and Selina grapple with their double lives 
lives while Joker and Penguin revel in the facade of authenticity. Whereas with Joel Schumacher and Zack Snyder, you see more of an interest in the mythic qualities of Batman. There's a Greek god motif that runs through both of their interpretations. For Schumacher, the Greek imagery conjures a sense of homoeroticism that greatly informs the ideas his films explore. Batman Forever is basically a coming out story, perhaps not in a literal sense, but it is a story about being unafraid of accepting who you are, told in a way I think only a gay man could have conveyed, whereas Snyder uses very similar iconography to depict a very different kind of story, the story about the existential dread felt by a mortal confronting a power beyond his comprehension, what that kind of experience does to the rules we live by, our code. And then there's Christopher Nolan, who, for as grounded and dark as his original trilogy films are, views Batman as an incorruptible symbol of hope and inspiration, almost Richard Donner's Superman-esque. Nolan is fascinated with how an ordinary man can rise above their limitations to become extraordinary, an aspirational figure. A character such as Batman is a deeply intricate and sprawling thread for any filmmaker to unravel. But when one does so successfully, they gain access to a well of narrative dramatic and thematic richness, as well as powerful character material that can guide storytelling at its highest level. You can enjoy a Batman film on a surface level, for what it's marketed as, and as a piece of comic book adjacent cinema. I'd even argue that most if not all of the filmmakers that have helmed Batman films to date are fine with or even want most people to watch these films that way. But underneath the surface, in this medium or in any of the others that have featured Batman, there are always countless layers underneath. Even in talking about Batman and the filmmaking ethos behind him, as I unpacked each point, there was more underneath to explore. It's almost like even a deep cinematic dive into Batman is still only scratching the surface. That's enticing as hell. If you've ever found yourself scratching your head at why some of the biggest names in filmmaking have attached themselves to, or at least enthusiastically pursued this character, well, that's why. It creates a filmmaking playground of limitless possibility where you can dive into any genre imaginable with this character and tell the story you want to tell. On the other side of that, I think it takes more than just a journeyman or a pedestrian filmmaker to tell stories in this world about this character. It takes a clear and deep vision. And other than the Adam West era Batman, that's probably why we've gotten a series of visionary auteurs at the helm in a way that we haven't with, well, any other IP really. Tim Burton, Joel Schumacher, Christopher Nolan, Zack Snyder, Matt Reeves, those are all heavyweights, past and present, of cinema. And however you feel about their contributions to the cinematic lore of Batman, all of them came at the character with a complete vision and the confidence to execute it. Batman is better for that, and I don't see that practice changing anytime soon. Because as different as one Batman film can be to another, that's the one vital piece of the formula that is consistent and shouldn't be tampered with. Oh, and you know, the paychecks, yeah. They're pretty massive too, that, that might play a, a part in it.